Welcome to Humans and AI, where I interview world-class AI leaders and creators to uncover best practices and insights for navigating the world of AI. I'm your host, Rin Chaudhry, the human behind Notabot and founder of AI for Anyone. Today's guest is Linus Ekenstem, one of my favorite builders in the space. Linus is a co-founder of Bedtime Story, and he's a CMO of Conch. And he's also the proud father of two girls, hashtag girl dad. Linus and I chat about his journey to becoming an AI creator, projects he's worked on and the projects he's most excited about, his favorite AI tools and how he finds them, and much, much more. Let's dive right in. Linus, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course, super excited to chat. So before we get started, do you mind just giving a quick overview of your background, what you do now? Yeah, sure. So my background is, I call myself a digital janitor. I've been doing a lot of things in, in, in the digital realm. I've been on the internet for the past 20 years. Briefly, I got started in edu- like agency land. I worked for a bunch of smaller firms and worked with clients and took myself from there to start my own studio. And back in 2012, I sold that studio. I started my first SaaS business failed miserably at that, building on top of Instagram's not public API at the time. But it was really good. That kind of pushed me into the trajectory of being in early tech, like whatever is happening, I've been close to the drama and the fire. So fast forward a few more years, I went to Typeform. I was one of the first employees or first design employees there. I got hired directly by one of the founders. And then I've been doing a few other startups. Recently, I was at Flowdesk.com and another uh, rather successful SaaS business in the email space. And then last year I decided to stop working for others. I've been going back and forth, being an employee and starting my own things. And yeah, I decided to go full on do AI stuff, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I wanted to build with the reasons, the latest stuff out there. Yeah. And that, that pushed me into this trajectory where I am now currently building a suite of tools, not necessarily a many tools, but I'm building a bunch of things. And the most prominent thing that's public is bedtimestory.ai, which is a story generator for kids, essentially, or parents and kids. Yeah, that that's basically it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And so when you decided to make that jump, I didn't realize, so you completely left everything and you just said, I'm just going to work for myself now. Did you have a plan at that point or did you just land on the whole AI tooling? No, I didn't really have a plan. I didn't have a plan the first time I started something either. I was just like, fuck it, let's go. Sorry, that's the swear word. But I felt that I was done with the whole kind of working for someone else, like selling my time. It's just time that I can't get back. I just got I got my first kid and I was like, I need to do, I need to figure out a way to work for myself and I take whatever it takes, right? And I've been like, I've been fortunate in my career. I've been fortunate to work in great companies alongside great people. I've managed to find myself financially in a good position where I can take leaps of faith, not worrying about paying my rent and putting food on the table for the family. So a bit of smartness along the way, I've put me in a good position. So I wasn't really worried, but yeah, I didn't really have a plan either. I was in the mood of just let's build stuff, throw it at the wall and see what happens. Yeah, that's kind of, that summarizes my line of thought. Yeah, interesting. And given your background, it seems like you already have a lot of the I guess you could say the skill sets that are required to just build. And so you mentioned you were designer for part of your career. I'm assuming you did front end design. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I've been a product designer. So UX, UI, like the, the whole term, like for me, it's like I've been a designer taking stuff from a blank canvas to finished product. So these days you might not find many of us, but we are there. There are definitely more skilled people than me out there as well, but like to be able to go from ideation, working alongside teams, building with the necessary tooling that you need to do and all the way to the, getting your first 100 or 1,000 customers. So I think that's been, it's really hard to put a finger on, okay, I'm good at doing that particular job in design. I'm more of a holistic person. I think that's my power or the, what I'm good at. But sometimes that's also bad because there are plenty of companies that don't have space for someone that's more of an entrepreneurial person than someone that fits the mold that can go particularly into a niche problem and be spearheading like a specific task in a team, for example, that's not me. I'm kind of the jack of all trades that just go in somewhere, solve big problems. And then hopefully by the end of it, still enjoy it that much that I want to be around. Yeah. So again, very fortunate to be able to, to, to see a bunch of companies go from very small size to large size. 
but also been solving like some really heavy problems in these companies. So they're super excited about that. Um, super cool. Yeah, and that's uh, really interesting that you say that too, because I was chatting with Mossad, who's the CEO of Replit, just a couple of days ago. And one of the things that he said was that the entrepreneurial types are going to be the ones that are going to succeed in this changing world. Because you had a lot of skill sets to start with that are difficult to attain, super powerful product design being one, just being able to take an idea for an application and being able to build it out. I think that's enormously powerful. And in the age of AI, with all of these AI tools emerging, it seems like it's becoming easier and easier. And the moat of having a software engineering background or having expertise and knowing a particular tool or whatnot, that seems to be chipping away. Is that what you're seeing as well? Or are you seeing it differently? Yeah, I think I am for the first time in my career, like honestly, hands to heart, like I'm the first time in my career, I'm really worried about actually being out of a job. So my response to that is to try to embrace this new technology shift and try to get as close to the action as possible with, with what I know and my skill set. I'm not a researcher. I'm not a machine learning expert. I got no idea what these guys and girls are doing in this field, but knowing what I know and applying what I had learned so far in my career, and I can see like, connecting the dots, I think I feel empowered, but I also see that this is potentially what's going to get me out of a job. So I better just like strap onto this rocket and hold on for dear life and try to come out on the other end, still in the game. I have this even 20 years of experience in, in tech, and I still feel every day, so I knew Dawn, like excited to build and like. I'm more hungry now than I was when I was 18, which is like, it's rare. It's very rare, I think. Maybe not in tech, but like in general, people are quite tired of working when they're hitting their 40s, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And from my perspective, you're doing such a wonderful job of this, of, of just embracing the technology and just moving forward. And it's one of those things where it's like, everyone's gonna have to adapt. And so it's better to just dive right in. And that's exactly what you've been doing. And so I wanna talk about that a little bit. What was the whole process of you observing what was happening in the AI space and saying, hey, like this is actually something I want to dive head first into? Was it more of a gradual process or was it like, oh shit, this is <laughs> happening. Let me just go all in before it takes my job. So I think it's a bit of both. The gradual shift that ha has happened over the past let's say a year or so for me, like a bit more, a bit more than a year. I had friends that started building really cool stuff using some of the underlying APIs and technologies that are now commonplace. And at first I didn't think much of it. I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's a very rare use case and that's cool. Probably a lot of people will find that helpful. And then like somewhere when GPT-3 was announced and we saw some of the early things being built with that, I was like, all right, wait a minute now. Now we're entering some really interesting territory here because I could see the end usage of this being so powerful, like so empowering for a lot of people where it's just a simple natural language interface. And then people started building more things with this and we saw stable diffusion pop up and we saw Dolly and Dolly 2 pop up. A lot of the things just happen coincidentally like next to each other. And if it's one thing that I've witnessed over and over, the last two decades is like when things compound and when these like p paradigm shifts happen, they usually don't come al alone. It's not just like one thing, but you see like it's building on top of each other. And then all of a sudden it's just like the snowball is rolling so fast that you cannot pick, you, you basically kind of jump on without just getting hammered onto the snowball and you're just like rolling along with it. And I saw that early with web, that's called web two, but social as well. I was, I think I was one of the first like that had Facebook in Sweden is really weird. Like I literally managed to get like a EDU email to get Facebook and then that snowballed happened. And now we have some of the biggest companies in the world are these social companies. Seeing the same thing now with AI early on, and we're still early on, like we are a bunch of nerds in this field, even though if chat GPT went viral and took over the world and managed to get a hundred million people using it, it's still fringe. Like for most people in tech, they've never touched AI. They never touched any of these APIs or, yeah. So I, I, just, yeah, that's, it's been gradual, but also there was a pivotal point. And I think now we're past the pivotal point. Now it's just, okay, it's full on, it's gonna happen. And we're seeing it and being embraced by all the big companies and it's gonna get omnipresent. Like 
having an AI assistant of some sort or having trans like a transformer of some sort available at your fingertips at any given point in time, it, it's just the way it's going to be. Like there's no going back. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I think we definitely have hit that tipping point, like the, all the yeah. momentum's behind it right now. And to a point where people are wondering, is this a bubble? Is this a fad? Which I have my own answers for that. I yeah. don't think so. And I would bet that you also align with that as well. But it's definitely got eyeballs from everyone at this point. I, I want to rewind really quickly. So you said cool. you were one of the first people in Sweden to have access to Facebook. That's really interesting. I, so how did you manage to get that EDU email address? And also I, curious, I, are you just generally an early adopter when it comes to technology? Yeah, I'd say like I'm a hyper early adopter. If you go through the, if you comb, fine comb the internet for like my writing or articles, you'd see like, I was bullish on VR way too early and I own that. I, that's fine by me. I'm still bullish on both VR and AR. Uh, I think from a paradigm shift in the way that we're doing computing right now, we're do, conducting this interview. I'm looking at a small little screen and it's the biggest screen I can get from my laptop, but it's still small. And like, we will enter an era at some point where we will do embodied computing. But I think me and a lot of other people were just too hyped up on it. We all drank from the same Kool-Aid. And I'm not likening the, what's going on with AI with VR. It's very different, very different. But yeah, in general, I'm an early adopter. And to the point why I got early access to Facebook, I had a friend that went to MIT and I managed to somehow acquire some old students email, I loaned it, and I managed to set up an account. Because it was still very hard to get a Facebook account if you didn't have a college campus email address. And then it's- So you had an account. MIT address. Yeah, I never went to MIT. <laughs> yeah, but it is interesting though, because I, I feel my proximity to being early in tech in general has just led me to have this magnet for things. And I also sense it in this community. I see a lot of familiar faces that's been around the block a few times. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if we're, if we're dead wrong or if we're right this time. Yeah, that's the interesting thing, Riz. Being an early adopter, I guess it price you have to pay is that you're going to have a lot of misses potentially where you might invest a lot of time into learning a technology, a tool that just ends up going nowhere. The tool is deprecated or the technology goes nowhere. And so I'm curious, did you run into that a lot in the past? Has it not deterred you? How do you keep that mindset even despite potentially it leading you maybe to a dead end at a certain point? That's a really good question. I think, let's put it this way. I have a very playful mindset when it comes to new tech. Okay, I think general, generally very playful mindset. I have very little ego in my work. And I usually just like, I want to feel like when I was a kid and I went to the playground with my friends and we all just played. I wish every day was like that. I wish I'd be going to an office, working with people, doing creative things. I don't want it to be unstructured and there's no goal or vision, but I want the work to feel like play. Let's just rewind it a bit. So at Typeform, circa 2016 or 17, when the Vive headset came out, I managed at the time to get signage from the CTO to hook me up with all I needed, like a, a custom built PC, like all the hardware to set up like a VR experiment in the basement. And I did, and I managed to personally walk through all 250 employees at the time in VR. They all booked sessions with me. I all did all the demos just to get people like excited about the future of VR. That led me nowhere. <laughs> I'm just saying, I still haven't built anything in VR. However, I think I changed the, those 250 people's opinions about VR. They got a taste of what's coming and they all got very excited about getting this experience. Uh, and it's funny how like none of them would have thought to have done the same if I wasn't there. So it's, in a way, I just want to figure out ways to have fun. And VR is a lot more fun than AI in that sense. but. There is so much we can do with AI that it feels it's like an ex ex abstraction layer that lives in the 2D pane where we're already living and experiencing internet in general. And it's a lot more obtainable for people because like VR is this big bulky thing. And like even now with the Quest headset, it's like very isolated. You do something and you're alone. But here, like doing stuff, putting it online, other people can try it out themselves. And this flywheel of just everyone riffing off everyone. I haven't seen that before in, in 
not at this scale this fast at least yeah okay so one of the big questions i have for you is like how are you dealing with all of this influx of ai tools right now what is Oof. your process for vetting and for testing them out it's like drinking out fire hose right so what yeah. is the process that you go through to identify the tools that you're going to test out and potentially use for applications you're building? The, the, that's a very good question. Like I, I've started, like for the stuff that we're building, the pipeline is quite easy to handle because we have some specific needs or problems that we're trying to solve and we're very looking at very specific tools to solve those problems. I can give you a clean example. Is we're looking to figure out something that can do text-to-speech really good and with a set of parameters that we like have decided are important for us. So then it becomes easy to kind of source and matrix decide to put everything in a matrix and start going one by one and putting pros and cons. What's more difficult is I'm, I am found myself in this peculiar situation where I amassed a bunch of followers on Twitter and I'm doing, I'm sharing my journey as I'm learning and discovering things there. And then it becomes a lot more tricky to understand, is this something that's useful for others? Is this useful for me? What are the implications? Is this a tool that could blow up and have 20 million users in the next 12 months? It, it becomes a bit more tricky to figure that one out. And my inbox, as, as anyone can imagine, I, the bunch of people that are doing what I'm doing as well, but there are so many companies building really cool stuff and they all want to pitch what they're doing and why we should try their things out and why that's the best. So that it's becoming in, increasingly hard. So in, in a sense, it feels like there is a bit of a bubble in tooling, but I think that's very common with all new like shifts that happens that everything bubbles up and now everyone is building on the same stuff and we're getting like 25 text editors. There won't be 25 text editors in a year from now. There will be a few that are really good and the rest have died. Uh, but we've seen that repeat, repeat over in the course of the internet history before. So that's just the way it's going to be. But what also is going to happen was we're going to have all this technology baked in the OS anyway. So do I even need a text editor that has AI built in? I don't know. But it, that, so it's like trying to work out what to test now that might be useful for me and others, and also trying to vet, okay, is this a solid idea one, one year down the line and how much time am I going to invest into this? I think one thing to mention there is like, Everyone, image generation in general, Mid Journey, Stable Diffusion, Dolly, if or Leonardo, and all these other tools that are popping up as well. Prompting is one thing that I think definitely will go away. So it's, if you're focusing too much as a person now learning prompt engineering or using the right keywords to get what you want, you're wasting your time. I think it's more important to work on learning the techniques or figuring out principles that will give you persistent output or like thinking, how can I communicate with AI, even though these things might change. So we're already seeing like half of the documentation from mid journey that was active three months ago is now deprecated. So it's the, the space is moving so fast that there's no point in becoming like a, an expert in mid journey prompting, for example, if you don't have the near term goal of selling prompts or something, but two models down the road, prompting might be a thing of the past. Interesting. So, so where are we heading? If we're moving away from prompting, like what is your more natural language, less, less kind of keyword prompting. Cause now if you look at, it's difficult to like also obtain like what, where are we going? I think it's a combination of key, like removing keyword prompting and going more natural language and what we want describing, but also more image to image or like using source material for your prompting. We see that with control net, for example, they just got released the other day and a combination of things I think will equate to how we're producing generative art or generative images or content in general. It's not going to get locked into a handful of people that are learning how to speak AI per se. It's going to be, become that because then it's going to be a barrier of entry. And I think yeah. we want to try to remove any type of barrier. That, that makes a ton of sense. And in terms of like how you're searching for tools now versus how you t search for tools before this massive generative yeah. AI boost or just the wave, what's the big difference you would say? I think there's a, a lot of aggregators already popping up. So like before there wasn't a lot of choice in terms of finding SaaS tools. There's just a few handful com like companies that are curating and posting SaaS businesses in general. Now there's a bunch of aggregators that are, you know, the tools gets listed, you can filter, you can find stuff. And the fire host is just pointed at you in a different way. And everyone is look like there's a lot of eyeballs, right? So everyone is trying to get in front of as many people as possible. 
So it's almost like a self, like the top of the funnel is not the problem. Like the fire hose is not the problem. There's just a handful of these, like there's probably around 10 different websites that are listing AI tools at the moment. And I think there's a maybe combined to 2000 ish tools at the moment that are worthy of actually being looked at, which is quite a lot. And if you start looking into different segments, there might be like 20 to 30 tools in each vertical. But again, I'm not too fussed about all the individual tools. If you go to, if you go to hugging face or if you go to replicate, like you, you, you can devour yourself in models in AI models that are doing all sorts of weird things. Ultimately, I think we'll, we're going to have to consolidate a lot of this. We can't have, maybe we can. I'm rambling a bit, but maybe we can, <laughs> maybe there can be tens of thousands of different things, but I'm sensing that's not where we're heading. I think we're heading to a, a place where we have more generalized models that can solve more complex problems that doesn't require you to switch between, let's say a plethora of models, but rather just to use a handful. And then those five models will get the work done for you one way. Yeah. Totally agree with you there. And in the meantime, actually, we're putting together our own uh, tool aggregator. And I totally agree with everything you described there. It's it's really interesting to see just the prol prol proliferation of tools right now. It's just, again, it's like drinking out of a fire hose and there's a million tools for the same job. And so it's like, how do yeah. you surface the one that is the most tried and tested and offers the slight advantage over the other tools. It is funny. This whole thing with the aggregator is funny because I did work for a year or so with a good friend of mine that started an aggregator for direct consumer brands. So thingtesting.com. And I can see a lot of similarities like now happening in, in the AI space and like the amount of tools that are coming out in the AI space, similar to how there is a lot of direct -to consumer brands just popping up like mushroom everywhere. So that's another interesting, also like connecting the dots going into a completely different markets, marketplace, like direct to consumer physical goods and looking at software and AI tools and how there, there's 200,000 sock brands, but yet wear socks, but there's currently probably around 2000 different AI tools that are doing, you know, wrapping chat GPT, or GPT-3. One benefit of having been an early adopter for this long and have got, gotten burned and not got burned, I've had the opportunity to be in many different markets or many different areas where, you know, like I'm not just been in, in B2B SaaS uh, and I'm not just niched in on that, but I've been across the board trying different things. And I think that's also part of why I got drawn into this early. I think I can just like, this is, like I said, I'm like a magnet to this. <laughs> I'm drawn to anything that's not new and shiny and fancy, but there's, oh, there, there is something here. So yeah, it's like, I, I hope that there is one massive aggregator that wins, like one Craigslist for AI tools, just like we have a product hunt for SaaS. I don't want product hunt to actually go and list a bunch of AI tools because literally in the past few months, like product hunt has become like an AI launch platform. Like every day, this is like AI tools from a bunch of indie makers, us included. <laughs> now I wish there was like another player. We need a bit of, they need a competition as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I would love to chat with it. I would love to chat with you separately about that at some point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll share the link with you and I would love your feedback. Awesome, Linus, moving on to the next segment, bedtime stories. Like that was the first time that I heard about the work that you were doing and I checked out the product. And, and funny enough, only a few days before I was thinking about this, I was like, all right, so one of the really interesting use cases here is like children's books. At the time my wife was pregnant. And so obviously children's related stuff was top of mind. So can you share a little bit more about the bedtime stories and the motivation for it, the story of putting it together and the direction you're going to take it in? Sure. Yeah. So to, to just, yeah, start with a uh, bedtime story was born. By, it's a small little, it was a small little idea or side project that me and my colleague, Brian, and my partner, Jenny started working on just to get feet wet in terms of doing something practical and combining multiple AI models into something that we actually also wanted to use ourselves. Essentially our problem definition was that I'm a, I'm a parent. My partner is a parent. Brian is a parent. We all have kids. We read a lot to our kids. We have a lot of books. I think it's like the 
if we look at our budget, it's like book purchases is probably one of the items that it takes a lot of the volume or the amount each month. And I, I don't mind that in my kids to have books and I want to read for my kids. However, we're also finding ourselves like reading a lot of fiction, like making up a lot of fiction stories, or we might try to incorporate something that happened during the day to help my two and a half year old like grapple with something that she had to go through. And we're making it up as we go. And then I tell the story. And then when it's my, my wife's time to tell the story, she doesn't know exactly what I said. So then my daughter or our daughter would go, that's not what dad said. Now I said it differently. And I'm like, oh, this is a painful problem. And we just, we don't know what we're doing in general with parenting. So we just like, we make shit up and we try. We have the same playful mentality there. It's just as long as we do more good than bad, I hope we end up on good on the, out, on the other side, we end up well. So with that problem statement of like having, you know, a lot of books, buying a lot of books, they become quite repetitive. They're not personalized. They don't update. Once a book is there and the bookshelf is there, and at some point it gets boring. What if we can just leverage AI to help us not take over? It was never the idea that I want to automate myself out of the equation, but I want to augment my abilities to tell stories to my daughter. And I want to make sure that me and my partner tell the same story if we start if we start telling them stories. And then we started and it became very obvious that this is a really good use case because a children's book or a children's story is quite short. It has a very strict narrative that it follows. It's usually the same pattern. And so it's obviously something that a, and a large language model will love to work with because it can produce this output persistently and with good quality. We went ahead and we started to do some really early tests and we said, oh, this is okay, this could work. And at the time I was also playing around with Dolly 2 and outpainting and I published some photos on Twitter way back when I didn't have any followers on Twitter. And one of the OpenAI founders added, like he sent me a DM and he's like, this is a really cool use case. And there's so much stuff we can do with this. I was like, okay, if he thinks it's cool, then maybe, maybe I should try, let's try to incorporate more things here. And then that's how we got started. And then it became very apparent that this is something that more people are going to try to do. And there is a bunch of. There's a bunch of good solutions out there. I think none of the solutions has taken the approach that we're taking, but um, yeah. And then I think Amar, so a, a guy I follow on Twitter, he had done like a mid journey book where he made everything ha like by hand and put some effort and time into making a book. And I just dropped a link there saying, Hey, this is what we're building with bedtime story. I didn't expect anyone to go to the website. And then all of a sudden it was just like went viral and we had, I don't know, a few thousand signups in one day. And people were obviously on the fence about, we hate this. This is the wrong thing to do. You're like, this is disturbing. What kind of dad are you? What's the future you want for your kids? Like all the sorts of weird things on that end. And then on the completely other side, you have the people that are, oh, this artwork is just stolen from someone. And, and then in the middle, we have some enthusiasts that are just like, oh, this is super cool. So I think like it started a healthy debate around what should be done and like, how can this be? And yeah, I understand all of that, but I'm just want to build stuff. <laughs> so, so I just kind of slowly backed out from the whole fist fight and just get, okay, th this has some merit to it. People like this. So let's just continue to build. And we're still in that mode where we're just like exploring and building and trying to build more of a platform rather than just like a single, like a general, like not just a single generator for a single story, but we're trying to build a platform around like publicly available stories that are indexed, searchable, filterable, and just like medium is for like article writing, but for kids stories. And the reason why we went with bedtime story, um, was just because it's a search term on Google that has quite high volume and it's fit the narrative of us focusing on something very easy to market and easy to build and we don't have to go crazy and try to solve for everything and just like focus and hone in on one thing. But it was always apparent from like the first story that we generated that this could be used to do a lot of really interesting things from education to solving. If you have, um, if you're going through rough times and you, you might need help with coping with that, like it could be something, a tool that you could use together with. A uh, youth therapist, or it's a lot in that space, like in health, but then all the way to fiction and bedtime stories, 
just, it's like, just imagine what kids can do if like they are augmenting their ability to output their thoughts. So it's like this whole chain of, oh, we can do a lot of things was something that came up really early. So I think ultimately once we we figured out what our, what we're good at and what like the stuff that we're doing behind the scenes to like glue everything together. We know what that is and how, have that nailed down. I think we will see like bedtime story going in a different direction, like becoming, I think our kind of internal wish or dream for it is to become a narrative company where you come he here to, to, to produce narratives, whether or not it's for kids or it doesn't matter. Like we, we see ourselves as a narrative company. And I think that's a very like lofty ambition and it's going to be very hard to pull off, but it's also interesting because we then have a moat to become a tool and not just someone that's wrapping another service, like in, in a little neat shell, but we actually want to build some of our own IP and we actually have a vision that's longer and bigger than just bedtime stories. However, bedtime stories is a very cool space to be in. So interesting. Um, you touched on so many really interesting topics there. One of them, just how polarizing some of this stuff can be. AI is obviously having such an outsized impact on the world and it's scared a lot of people, right, rightfully. Rightfully so, yeah. Yeah, and so when tools are created, a lot of folks, the first thing they think of is, all right, so who does this adversely impact? And can we prevent those adverse impacts? And is this a net positive? Is it not? But I think that's a builder's mindset, the one that you described. And I think in the end, technology isn't going to stop for anyone, right? Is my own. That, sadly, so back to the fact that I think I'm going to get automated out and this is my reaction to it. Just like... <laughs> I think everyone's going to have to be reactionary, right? But going back to your, like the entire use case that you focus on, I think this is such an interesting one because especially in the educational space, I was talking with one of my friends who is a VC who invests in ed tech startups. And one of the things he told me that was really surprising was that literacy is probably the biggest problem in the education space in America today. And that surprised me because I'm like, this seems like literacy isn't that big of a problem in the US. But he said a lot of parents are finding out that their children are reading, but they're not actually learning how to read, right? Like they're just, it's more of a superficial type of reading that children are doing where they're not truly understanding how to read to, to, to the level that the educators want them to. And so a big potential solution to that is more personalized content, right? It's stuff that they're maybe a little bit more engaged to read rather than reading about Jack and Jill, reading about themselves in a story or a situation which interests them and learning that way. And I think the educational angle is such an interesting one. I think there's huge potential there. And I'm so excited to see what Bedtime Story and whatever else is going to branch yeah. off of that, wherever you decide to take that. I think there's just massive implications there. Yeah. I think there's a bunch of people that are already working on like specifically solving educational story creation or even learning. Mark is one of the founders of Us Two Games or like one of the early, earlier employees. I don't know if it's a founder or not, but I know that they are working on a tool like this for education that's like targeting kids with a diagnosis. It could be ADHD or it could be other like learning disabilities. And it just exactly what you're saying here is like having the ability to personalize the content on the fly having it delivered personalized on the fly, having the questionnaire or the, like what is you, that you're learning to be also personalized, it, it's going to be a paradigm shift in how we learn. And I think this is one of the fundamental changes that large language models will bring to the next generation. It's just the, the breadth of information and the, the richness in how people are going to be able to inquire information. It's just going to make Google look like an old landline telephone. It's just, it's going to be crazy when we think back at this and go, you actually had to Google and it was a skill to Google things. Like, did you live in the ice age? Did you guys have mammoths? It's just going to be very strange. And even to the point where like my two-year-old, her definition of Google is an omnipresent voice in our house. She doesn't know that Google is a search engine for her. What all she cares about, you ask Google to play songs on Spotify, or you ask Google about the weather and it's there, it's in her room, it's in the living, it's everywhere. So 
my definition of Google and the age old, like you have to Google stuff to learn and her definition of Google and what she will do to learn, that's just gonna be very different. So yeah, I'm super excited about this. And I think I, I we just hope more people can put on their excited mindset. And of course, there's a lot of problems that we need to solve, like with any new tech, and we need to be vigilant and not fall in the same traps as we did with social, because social is going to have impacts far longer than what we anticipated. And it's going to be something that we're going to have to deal with as a society. But I think like, yeah, don't get too cautious. I don't put up roadblocks just because you want to put up roadblocks. Yeah, it's super excited about this. I could probably talk about implications for the next generations for hours, <laughs> literally for hours. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's a great segue to closing here. If you had a megaphone to the next generation, what would you tell them specifically in regards to just preparing and adapting to how the world is changing as a result of AI? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think what the next generation needs to become very good at is asking really good questions. Like the, the and then that's true currently as well, but like, I don't think we had the same issue. Like the, I think next generation needs to become expert inquisitors. They need to be really good at just asking very good questions. And if they can ask good questions, I think AI will be a, a very powerful liaison in, in that relationship in the future, because AI is not going away. Like the gene is out of the bottle. We can try our best to regulate. We can try our best to sort this out, but Moore's law is continuing. Compute power is, um, it's still exponential. People don't get this, like wrapping your head around all of that, whatever, get good at asking questions. That's not going to get old. Even if we have AI, that's going to be good at asking questions. You as a person or as a human, our ability to imagine and rethink and reform and also adapt. I think, yeah, if we're, if there's one thing, the next generation needs to be good at is asking questions. Yeah. Love it. Great advice. And last question for you. If there was three tools that you could, three AI tools, of course, that you could <laughs> recommend to folks if they're just starting to dabble into the world of AI creation, which three tools would you recommend they start with? If I, if I would give advice on three tools to get started with AI, I'd say go to chat GPT, experience what the best of the best is in terms of a large language model and a user interface. And then mid journey, even though it's uh, difficult to maybe get across the discord situation, but then you get a good idea of how the future model works and then text to speech, I'd use 11 labs to get a sense for how powerful the current state of the art voice synthesis is. So let's leave it at that. Perfect. Final question. Where can people find you? How can they follow all the great work that you're doing and learn from all of the wonderful prompting and the projects that you're building? So people can find me. I'm more, most active on Twitter, Linus Ekenstam on Twitter. And then I write a Substack as well. So it's linusekenstam.substack.com. And yeah, I got a website, but hasn't, I haven't updated my website in, since 2017. And I keep getting like, tens of DMs a week now. It's like, dude, you need to update your website. I'm like, whenever I have the time, I'll do it. Update whenever it. you're done building. Whenever I'm done building. <laughs> We're changing <Awesome>. diapers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know how you feel now. Linus, I'll add those links in the show notes, but thank you so much for your time and uh, thank you for being the inaugural guest for the Not A Bot Creator Series. Super excited to get Perfect. this out. I appreciate it. Good chatting.